In this video, we will talk about 822.11 wireless LANs, popularly known as Wi-Fi. Now, 822.11 is the technical standard for Wi-Fi, and there are a number of versions like A, B, G, N, and so on and so forth. The most latest version of Wi-Fi, 882.11ax. Now, how do these standards differ? They differ typically in the spectrum that they use. For example, 822.11b, G, and N all use 2.4 to 5 gigahertz, the unlicensed spectrum. They also differ in the speeds that they can offer. And typically as standards, the newer standards offer more speeds than the previous ones. For example, 822.11b only offered up to 11 megabits per second, whereas 822.11n, which used multiple antennas, uh, provides up to 200 megabits per second. Now, one thing that is common across all these different technologies is that they all use CSMACA for multiple access and they all have base station and ad hoc mode versions. Now, CSMACA may not make so much sense to you at this present moment, but we'll discuss this later in this video. Now, the 82.11 architecture, let's talk more about that. So first we have the wireless hosts, which are your typical smartphones or Wi-Fi, which connect to the base station. Now the base station in a Wi-Fi network is the access point. Now what we have is a basic service set or BSS. It is, our, it is also known as the cell in infrastructure mode. And what it contains is basically the wireless hosts, your smartphones, laptops, any other device which connects to your access point using a Wi-Fi using the Wi-Fi network and then the access point itself. Now, the next component of an 822.11 network are the different channels and how the different hosts associated, associate with the access point using these channels. Now, I'll talk to you about 822.11b, though it's an older standard, but it's much of the things that I discussed today are, are also valid in today's newer uh, Wi-Fi versions. Now, 82.11b was divided into 11 channels and the, the entire range from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.485 gigahertz was divided into these 11 channels. Now, if you're an AP admin, or the AP, what the AP admin has to do is to choose the frequency to which this particular AP will be tuned into. Now, the way an admin chooses these different frequencies for the different access points in a building are to choose these channels such that neighboring access points have less as less interference as possible. Now, if you're a host, which is a laptop or a smartphone, it has to connect with one of these access points. Now, if you, as soon as you enter uh, the network, by you, I mean the host, what it does is it scans these channels and it listens for some beacon frames to understand if there is an access point nearby. Now, these beacon frames, what they contain are the access point's name, which is the SSID, and the MAC address. Now, when a host enters into this Wi-Fi jungle, it might actually receive a bunch of beacon frames from different access points. Now, once it receives all these beacons, what the host must do is it must choose the access point with which it has to associate with. Now, this access point may require some kind of authentication, and we'll talk about authentication in a bunch of later or later videos. And once the host has been authenticated, the view usually what the access point does is it runs DHCP. And if you recollect from previous videos, DHCP is used to get an IP address, and then the host can get connected to this access point or is in the access point subnet and it can send packets to the greater internet. So now let's see how a host actually connects to an access point. So first, when a host arrives, there are two approaches that it can adopt. One is passive scanning and the other one is active scanning. Now in passive scanning, what happens is the beacon frames are constantly sent from the APs uh, or the access points. Now, when a host arrives, in if you if you look at the figure, it receives two uh, uh, two beacons, and that is marked as one from access point one and from access point two. Now, 
this host then has to choose which access point it wants to connect to. Typically hosts would connect to that access point to which they have the best signal quality so that they have better data rates. So let's assume that access point 2 has better signal quality than uh, access point 1 and hence host 1 connects to access point 2. So to do that, what it does, it sends a request association request message, which is in mouth as 2 in that figure. And once the access point receives this association request message, it sends a response saying that you have, you have now been connected to this access point. This is what happens in pa passive scanning. Now in active scanning, it, the, the opposite methodology occurs. So when a host enters into a network, it sends out this broadcast message saying that it is here and it wants to connect to this Wi-Fi network. Now, <clears throat> all the access points which receive this message typically reply back to the host. For, so in this figure, if you see, in the first step, the host 1 is sending out the broadcast message which reaches both access point 1 and access point 2. Both access points 1 and 2 respond and, and they send a response message. Now, once the host receives these response messages, what it does is it typically chooses once again the Y the access point from which it has the to which it has the best signal quality, and it sends the association request. That's what happens in step three, and then in step four, the AP says that it is uh, that they they are connected and that the host can send messages to the greater internet through the AP. Now, the next important aspect of A22.11 is multiple access. Now, in your home network itself, you would have seen that there are multiple devices which connect to your access point at the same time, that is your Wi-Fi router. Now, all these devices are using a shared medium, which is wireless. Now, what happens when multiple nodes communicate with each other over a wireless medium? Now, when, if multiple nodes communicate at the same time, Time or they transmit at the same time, what can happen is there can be collisions. This is, to, to give you a good example, if two people talk at the same time, it is very difficult to understand what each of them is individually saying. This is because their words are colliding with each other. So to avoid these kind of collisions, what is typically used is CSMA. Now what is CSMA? CSMA is the acronym for Career Sense Multiple Access. And it's basic, what it incorporates is basic common sense. That is, before a node transmits, what it checks is, is there an ongoing transmission? If there is an ongoing transmission, it does not make any sense for this node to transmit because then what is going to happen is the ongoing transmission is also going to get corrupted. So it just keeps silent if there is an ongoing transmission. But then what it does is if there is no ongoing transmission, it can then transmit. But the biggest issue is that, see, this just having CSMA is not sufficient because in a wireless network, there is no way to detect a collision. This is because signals are very difficult to receive and they are weak, weakened due to a whole bunch of factors that happen in the environment. And hence, the, the receivers are not well equipped to detect collisions. So how would, what would a uh, node do if it cannot detect a collision. Say a collision happened and the node does not even know that a collision has happened, then it wouldn't even transmit the same packet again. And this is not acceptable. So to do that, the goal is to have avoidance, which is C and the protocol is CSMA CA, where CA stands for collision avoidance. So let's try to understand this particular multiple access protocol. So in CSMA, see what the 822.11 sender does is, if the channel is idle for a diff, which is a small period of time for which um, it senses the channel, then it can transmit the entire frame. Now, if the channel is busy, what it will do is it will back off for a certain period of time and then check again to see if the channel is idle. Okay. Now, at the receiver, if the pre if the frame is received correctly, what it would do is it would return an acknowledgement after a SIFS, which is another short duration of time, and just to make sure that no collisions occur. So let's just see how this uh, protocol works. So first, the sender waits for the diffs 
and then it sends the data the receiver waits uh, for a small period of time which is equivalent to SIFS before sending back the acknowledgement. Now let's try to understand a little bit more about what happens, how collisions are avoided in this case. Now to, uh, to, to prevent collisions from happening, what a 11 allows us is to use something called RTS-CTS. Now RTS is request to transmit while CTS is a clear to clear to send. Now, the basic idea is for a host to reserve the channel before sending its data so that collisions can be avoided. So let's see how uh, this RTS CTS actually works. So let's assume that this is the scenario where there are hosts A and B and there is an access point in between. What host A and host they want to do is they both have data that they want to send. So they first, before sending the data, they want to reserve the channel. So let's assume that both host A and host B send this RTS. What happens that there is a collision because they both transmitted at the same time and the AP cannot decode the messages that were sent by A and B. After this, both of them wait for some time and let's assume that uh, the host A then transmits the RTS again. At this time, uh, host B is not <clears throat> sending the RTS. Now, what happens is the AP receives this RTS, and if you follow the green bar, you can see that it's slowly fading. So, what it signifies is this RTS message sent by A does not reach B. So, B is not aware of the fact that A has actually sent a request uh, to send. Now, when the access point receives it, what it sends is this CTS message saying that A is clear to send. This message is received by both A and B. Now B knows because it receives a CTS for A that it knows that A has the channel and it would refrain from sending its RTS which is it wants to have the channel till A is transmitting. So now after this A has the channel so it transmits the entire data and after the data has been transmitted to the access point. What the access point does is it basically sends an acknowledgement saying that the data has been correctly received. Now after this, B is now free to send another RTS message to, to get hold of the channel again. So this is how RTC, RTS CTS works in uh, CSMACA and with the use of this RTS and CTS, collision avoidance is ensured in a in an 82.11 network. The there's a last thing that I want to talk to you about in 82.11 is addressing. Now, in a, in an Ethernet, if you if you remember, there were only two MAC addresses. But here in 82.11 frame, there are three MAC addresses. The first address is the the MAC address of the wireless host or access point, which is about to receive this frame. And the second address is the MAC address of the wireless host or AP, which is transmitting the frame. And the third is the MAC address of the router interface to which the AP is attached. So let's see why we need these three addresses in 82.11 frame, whereas in 82.3 frame, that is Ethernet, we only required two addresses. So let's look at this particular example. So now host A is sending a frame sorry, host H1 is sending a frame. So what happens is in the first address, it has the address of the AP. The second is the, its own address, which is H1's uh, MAC address. And in address three is the MAC address of the router. Now, H1 is going to communicate with the router R1 using this access point. Now, the router is connected using a wired link to the access point, whereas the link between H1 and the access point is wireless. So there is 802.11 a technology in the wireless link and there is Ethernet on the wired link. So this wireless link is sitting uh, or this wireless access point is sitting in between the host H1 and the router R1. Now when the access point receives this message, what it does is it constructs an 802. 3 frame and what it does is it puts the 
R1's MAC address as a destination address and the host's MAC address, that's H1's MAC address, as the source address. Therefore, this router, router R1, is oblivious of the existence of the access point and what the router believes is it is directly connected to h1 so to help this kind or of, to facilitate this kind of seamless transition between 802.11 and 802.3 we have 802.11 frames have three different addresses with this i'll conclude this